everyone uh, and welcome back to the doctor will see you now um at the moment that this uh, session is being recorded uh, entering into a, a little bit of summer time here uh, you'll notice from the background that dr noir is away from the usual consultation room uh, and uh, we're doing our summer consultation from uh, west wales now, it's also a welcome back to the author with us today. And for those of you who are, are frequent viewers to The Doctor Will See You Now, you know that it's pretty unusual to have an author back. However, yeah. some authors just have to be welcome back because the latest book that they've penned that's been released, well, it's whetted the doctor's appetite. Uh, and those of you who know me personally will know by, why when we get into conversation. It is a tremendous pleasure to welcome Martin Walker back. Hello, sir. How are you? Hello there. I'm very, I'm very pleased to see you. And I'm pleased to see you in the sunshine, too. It, it, it makes a heck of a difference. And I think it's very fitting for the book as well. Um, the sense of the summertime setting that we've got there. However, the dark clouds will be gathering uh, and it will be getting menacing. Now, for anybody viewing who's not familiar with Martin and his work, he's a former foreign correspondent to the former USSR, the USA, Europe and Africa for The Guardian. Uh, author of histories of the Cold War and 20th century USA and of studies of Gorbachev, Clinton in the extreme right. Um, at present, though, he's writing stories uh, set in the Perigord region of rural France or France. Yeah, when we get into talking about France, I, I want to do this French accent and, and, <laughs> I, and I can't help it. I love it. Um, and of course, anybody who's familiar with that space, that wonderful region, knows that it's home to truffle, foie gras, tremendous cheeses and wonderful wines and it's a moments like this martin that i wish you and i were in the same space uh <laughs> i could well or we could be showing i could bring you french as uh, welsh cheeses uh and, and we could do a cheese swap i think that would be yeah uh, but idea. yeah now this amazing series uh the uh the, the dodoin mysteries um has a tremendous uh, main character as well, uh, Bruno, chief of police, uh, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about him as well. Uh, find out more about his background. But I do recall last time that we did mention, I don't think, the fact that he has a past as a UN peacekeeper, uh, and that he was wounded in the in the siege of Sarajevo. Um, and I just wondered about that choice because if you you could have had a background to him, lots of different places is Sarajevo important to you Martin well it, it is because um it was the first real sign that after the end of the cold war with the collapse of the Soviet Union that it wasn't all going to be hunky-dory that it wasn't all going to be you know peace now and ever after that in fact that the old the old nightmares of uh, of nationalism and of sectarianism were always ready to raise their head and there were always going to be politicians um, who were ready to try and take advantage of this. And I must say that this, this rather dates me because this is the 15th book in the series. And it was in the very first one, 15 years ago, that, um, that I introduced Bruno as somebody who had this background in the French army for 10 years and had then been a peacekeeper with the UN, won the Croix de Guerre um, at, at a, during a bombardment of Sarajevo airport when he had to try and pull some French guys out of a burning armored car um, and um, then gets wounded by a sniper, is invalided out of the uh, out of the French army. And after recovering, he becomes a local policeman. So, I mean, having got that background there, I was stuck with it. So here we are 15 years on and I'm still referring to it. But, you know, it's uh, Europe has become once again a pretty dangerous place. I think mm. it's pretty clear. Mm. And uh, even in rural France, we are not immune from this kind of uh, from this kind of mayhem, this kind of aggression, this kind of uh, this kind of difficulty. So, I mean, in the past, I brought in Basque uh, terrorists, I brought in Islamic terrorists, I brought in whatever the news is throwing at me. And this time, I'm throwing in something different. 
Indeed, indeed. So this 15th book, yeah. which is tremendous to think a, a series of that magnitude. I, I just think, well done. And, and because I think for anybody who enjoys good storytelling, the thought that you can immerse yourself in a place with a character and all those people around him, um, that it's not a quick fix. It's, you know, I, I can devote myself. And I think the way you write, and it has to be said, the way you write, it totally transports the reader. I don't think, I don't think it matters where you are reading your novels, Martin. I think you find yourself, it's like, no, I'm not in France. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm here. There's such flavour uh, and texture uh, and, and cultural surroundings that it's, it's a well, wonderful, no, I, honestly, it's a wonderful way to lose yourself. Well, in, in a way, you know, I mean, I, I sometimes think that the, the main character in my books is, uh, is not Bruno, the, who is the hero. Mm -hmm. It's rather more the Perigord itself and all of the things that make it special from all of the prehistory, the, the yeah. painted caves, 18,000 years old, the medieval castles, the history of the English and French wars, the wars of religion, the wine, the food, um, all of this sort of comes together, and, and because it's part of my life here and part of my surroundings, I cannot not bring it in. Yeah. And yeah. I, I find it, it's captivated me, and I think it, it, it entrances quite a lot of readers as well. And I do think that comes across, though, in the way that you write. You know, this isn't like a, a perfunctory, better have some background detail. You know, it's, all, you know, it, it's, I don't know. I, I, I sometimes talk about, you know, authors that write in, you know, a love letter to a place. But I even think it's something deeper. You know, if this isn't just a correspondence and that, you know, I, I, it, it, this is something that is within you, I think. I don't know, well, would you say that? I, I I would. I mean, it, it's somehow, I mean, I've been here off and on. I've been visiting for nearly 40 years mm -hmm. and I've been based here for over 20 now. And it's, um, it's, you know, I've seen my, I've developed my garden here. I've seen my chickens grow and I've learned to be, I never thought I would be a gardener. I never thought I would live on my own fruit trees and my own vegetables and my own eggs. Um, I, I really never thought that I could sort of become have an entirely different kind of nationality almost and yeah. and it's not French it's sort of local Perry Gaudin and it's uh, and uh, I, a lot of it is to do with my friends and neighbours in the region um, who have really been extraordinarily welcoming and kind um, but it's also that, that I just keep on finding wonderful things that interest me like um, I mean I, I became interested in um, the medieval music of this area and the Perigord. I've got a neighbor whose answering machine, uh, he answers not in French, but in the old language of Occitan, mm. which a lot of the old people still speak. And the origin of, of European music really comes from the troubadours. And they sang in Occitan. Richard Lionheart, for example, the King of England, he wrote his songs and his poems in Occitan. That was his mother tongue, because his mother was Eleanor, Eleanor. Duchess of Aquitaine. Yeah. Um, uh, and the more I developed into this, the more I began listening to some of this old music and the modern versions of it that we're getting, I, uh, I, I began looking into it more and more deeply. And I found that the way Eleanor got to hear of this music was from a lot of uh, Moorish prisoners who had been taken by her grandfather when he was on crusade in Spain against the Moors. Mm -hmm. And all, all of the musical instruments that we began using in the Middle Ages came from the Moors. Mm -hmm. The tradition of that poetry, the rhythms of the music, it came from the Moors. And an awful lot of what's been called the 12th century Renaissance, mm -hmm. this sort of explosion of new learning, came from the Moors because they had preserved things like Aristotle and Euclid's mathematics much better than anybody in Western Europe had. So everything starts to change. The architecture starts to change. We start building churches with domes in them. Um, we, we start li listening to this different kind of music. And again, thanks to Eleanor, there is a common European myth that goes everywhere. And it starts off in Wales with Gerard of Monmouth, <laughs> And it's the tales of King Arthur and the Round Table. And they're going everywhere across Europe until in the 19th century, 
Richard Wagner, the great, uh, the great German composer, is writing an opera called Parsifal about Sir Percival of the Round Table. And a lot of the stories were brought in by Eleanor, who deliberately tried to promote this theme because she thought it gave a, it gave a concept of romantic love which was quite unusual in those days. I mean, if you look back at the Greeks, none of the three forms of love that they cite are what we would call romantic love. The vast majority of marriages were arranged for the upper classes mm -hmm. and were pretty much forced by where you happen to be born and brought up for the lower classes because people didn't travel that much. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's only the really rich people like Eleanor who could after a while say, I want to marry for love. And she did. That's why she married the man who became King Henry II of England, um, because she'd been married to this useless French king, Louis, <laughs> whom she said, I, I thought I was marrying a man. He turned out to be a monk. And then she finds Oops. this Oh yes, then she finds this uh, this uh, this rather uh, rather tasty young uh, young uh, Duke of uh, Count of uh, of, of Anjou, who is going to become Richard Richard Henry King Henry of England, and she marries him. And she only had two daughters by King Louis, but she had son after son after son after son by uh, by. By, mm -hmm. by Henry. And it really was for quite some time until she joined a rebellion against him and he had her arrested and locked up for some years in luxurious conditions. Um, they it seemed to be at least at first a marriage of love or at least a passion. Passion, passion yeah, Fol yeah following those feelings. Um, and, and, and so your book brings us to kill a troubadour. Yeah. Um, I thought it was an ingenious title um, because it reminded me, of course, to kill a mockingbird, but, but we're killing a troubadour. And you've given us some beautiful background to the power of music. And I'm, I always marvel at the fact of long before there was anything technical, how yeah. music manages to travel continents. Yeah. I know it takes a little bit longer, but the influence that music has still seems to be the same it's just the speed with which that influence takes place you know um, that, that they're here they found musical instruments flutes 20 more than 20,000 years old i mean it's not just the human voice we have this urge to to hit things and to have a beat and to play yeah. diddly on ponds and yeah it's um it's innate to us isn't it isn't it and and, and a, an expression also that manages to bring us together uh, yeah. you know when there is so much that can come between us that music yeah. seems to have that ability you know things can be put aside and we can share music and we can create together and we can listen to other people's performances and yeah, yeah. so in your book I wonder if you wouldn't mind um telling us about the notion of the modern troubadour that you bring to us in this 15th in the series. Well, I've, I've got some friends who uh, are indeed modern troubadours. They're trying to, they're making modern versions of, uh, of the old medieval songs. There's a guy called Jean Bonfant, who is really you know, quite well known in this area. And we have occasionally, we have these free concerts by, you know, people doing the modern version of the, of this music. And so uh, I was writing this at the time of the great sort of dramas in Catalonia, with Catal Catalonia driving for independence and the Spanish government resisting quite fiercely. And, um, and of course, one of the things that links the Occitan language of, old, of, of this old part of France is that it's almost indistinguishable from Catalan. And there's a great deal of cultural mm. connection between mm. southwestern France and across the Pyrenees into Barcelona and Catalonia. So um, I had this idea of, OK, we've got a guy rather like Jean Bonnefant. We've got a guy who is a real scholar of the Middle Ages and of the troubadours music. And he's trying to recreate some of it. But he's also very interested in what's happening in Catalonia. He finds himself living with a Catalan woman who is a real nationalist enthusiast. Mm -hmm. And she dies somewhat tragically um, in what may or may not have been an accident during the big general strike when several people did die in Catalonia. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so he writes a song, a song for Catalonia. And he uh, has it recorded by some friends of his who are musicians playing these old instruments. 
and it suddenly starts to take off. And for the first time ever, one of these songs has sort of got into the hit parade. And all of a sudden, the Spanish government decides it's going to ban it from French, from uh, Spanish TV and radio. And people are very, very surprised about this, particularly Bruno, because one of the things that as a local policeman he does, he organizes the free concerts on the quayside by the river for the tourists throughout the summer. And he always books the Troubadours, which is the name of this group. And of course, now that they've got a hit record, everybody wants to come along. But then we find that there is, uh, there's been a rather mysterious car crash of a stolen car that seems to have come from the Spanish border. And in the car, they found a very unusual bullet. It's a 12.7 millimeter, which is like a half an inch bullet, which is even bigger than you get on an elephant gun. And it's normally used for hunting things like um, very, very big game or for anti-aircraft fire, but also these days for really high level snipers. And it was the Russians who developed this uh, this technique of using a very heavy weapon mm. for snipers, and it's now quite common. And I mean, I've been I've always been interested in snipers, and um, particularly now that you know I've seen year by year the record distance at which they are hitting targets has gone up from one mile to close to three miles now. I mean, there's a couple of Canadian guys who uh, who currently who had the record. There were some British girl, soldiers in Afghanistan who had the record, but. It is extraordinary the kind of accuracy they can find. And so Bruno and Jean-Jacques, the chief detective of the mm -hmm. department, both think, what on earth is this unusual bullet doing here? And what is the connection with Spain? And then um, one thing, as they start inquiring, they find out that French, uh, French cyber intelligence is starting to realize that something very unusual was happening with this troubadour song, the song for Catalonia, that there was some kind of bot system that was feeding it onto more and more websites, building up its reputation, playing it more and more and making it a hit record. And where did this, where were these bot sites originated? Uh, well, that was the question and off we go into a very complex, into a very complex, well, not that complex, into a complex story that brings in an extraordinary woman who really existed called Africa de los Hea, and a Spanish woman from mm. a, quite a wealthy background who joined the Communist Party just before the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. She gets out before the Spanish, Spanish Civil War is lost and becomes a full-time hood for Soviet intelligence, for the forerunner of the KGB. And she is one of the people who is assigned to the assassination of Leon Trotsky. Now, all of this is true. Mm -hmm. This woman really existed. She was sent to Norway, where for a while he was in exile, trying to track him down. Then she was in Mexico City, where they finally succeeded in Just killing him. Yeah. But uh, I wanted to bring this kind of history back in because for me, the connection is quite close because I remember when I was in Moscow, when Kim Philby died mm -hmm. and I went to the cemetery to see where they buried him. And I'd heard that, for, that there was another very interesting uh, old Soviet spy who just, uh, who just passed on at this same time. And that's how I first heard about Africa, the Lothias. And... Um, so I thought this is too good not to bring into a book. So, you know, though, just just in what you've shared with us now, I mean, again, you encompass so much. You take us back into the past, but you also bring us to cutting edge, and yeah. and what is happening, and it's all within the space, you know, of so of, of a beautiful crime fiction book. Um, you know, it's like how. Do you have a special blender, Martin, with which you put all these elements together? I, I would, you know, I, I just wonder the no. journey, the journey that you take with all this. And and as you know, I mean, it's been a year since we've last spoken, whilst, you know, so this story's germinated and you've you've you have you have wrangled with it. But but your process, I mean, do you do, do you find that you know there are things that I would love to bring in, but this just won't suit for now? Um, or are you able, you know, to, to do this amazing tapestry and leave nothing behind that you find? 
No, I mean, I some ideas that come to me, I'll put into a notebook and put into another book because I'm always thinking of the next book as well. Um, mm. And I mean, the, where I'm so lucky is on the one hand, I've had a pretty varied career. I mean, I've, I've, I've worked and lived around the world. Mm. And I've been in sort of watching politics quite close up in a lot of countries. Um, and again, I, you know, as I, I, having written the history of the Cold War, I, I know quite a lot about all yeah. of that. Yeah. And I maintain my interest in it. Um, and so the, there's always that theme that's there, that we are still in a world of great powers. We are still in a world of, of national, national rivalries and of, uh, of national interests. But at the same time, I mean, I'm learning more and more about this amazing area like the Perigord. Like I've really become enthused about the troubadours and the medieval past as well. You know, in many of my other books, I brought in quite a lot of the prehistory, the Cro-Magnons yes. and the yeah. Neanderthals and so on. And because to me, they're, I mean, they're not that distant. You know, when you pick up in the fields, which you can here, you pick up a stone, which you see has been worked into having a, a quite a sharp point on it. You think, well, 20, 25, 30,000 years ago, people were making this as a tool. And I've been to so many of the caves now and seen so many of the, mm -hmm. of the things. And I keep learning stuff because archeology span is not a dead topic. It's completely alive. We're learning stuff all the time. Only in the past few years have we got, have the archeologists got the kind of laser technology that allows them to look at the plaque on the teeth of the skulls and to work out what they actually ate. And for a long time, we used to think that what they ate was mainly meat, you know, mammoth legs or deer mm -hmm. or, or reindeer or something. Yeah, they ate a lot of that, but they also did eat a lot of fed fruit and vegetables, berries, turnips, it turns out, are native to this place. Um, and I remember when I was in Southeast Asia being struck by how people would eat an awful lot of riverweed, um, uh, duckweed, if you like, mm, yeah. um, as a kind of a salad. And then I find out that Good Lord, these uh, Cro-Magnon people were eating quite a lot of this as salad as well. So I, I picked some and tried it. And I made a salad out of the duckweed from the local River Vezere. And, you know, with a bit of vinegar and garlic and olive oil and salt and pepper. Not bad, really. I mean, you could live off this stuff. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I just, and also the kind of the river plants that you get, the, the ones with the great big bulbs in them at the bottom, the rhizomes, yes. they're very like potatoes and quite nutritious. And so, um, I mean, that's all new. The other thing that's new is we never used to know how it was that at places like Lascaux, they could paint the ceilings. Yes. Because the ceiling's about three, four meters high. They invented scaffolding. How did they make the scaffolding? They had to invent rope. Now, we were long baffled by, archaeologists were long baffled by a certain kind of quite common carving, which would be take a reindeer out antler and drill three holes in it. I thought, what on earth was that for? What we now know, it was to make rope. They would feed strands of hemp, not cannabis, but the other kind, yeah, yeah. strands of hemp through each of these three holes and then use the three holes to twist them together into a common thread. And that was what we only found out, but the archaeologists found out by accident when they came across a piece of what they thought was just a piece of pebble on the on the ground of a cave. And they found actually, no, this was a piece of clay which was imprinted with the weaving of a rope. And at that point, they began to think, aha, that's how they made their scaffolding. And this is how they made their rope. And can you imagine the, the kind of breakthrough that was? for human development to yeah. invent rope yeah 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 to be able to, yeah 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 i mean so what what an area to live in uh, you know and that you draw on all of that but you've, you've just been talking to us about the you know the diet from from way back when and not so different and of course those of us familiar with your series um you know food and the preparation and the enjoyment of of food is so crucial to Bruno's life. Um, yeah. In fact, like, I was thinking as you were talking about him organizing, you know, the summer concerts and and, and, and all that he does. I was thinking, to what extent is his police work? <laughs> you know, where, where, where does the police work fit for him? And is it just it's a job that he has and everything else? No, I'll tell you why it fits. I mean, it's the same reason 
that he makes a point of spending a lot of his free time teaching the local kids in school to play tennis in the summer and rugby in the winter. That's to say that all of these kids grow up with Bruno. Mm -hmm. They grow up knowing he's their local policeman. They know him well. Their mothers know him well because he's danced at their mother's weddings. Yes. The entire family knows him because he's helped bury the grandparents or whatever. I mean, he knows everybody. Yes. He's been, he's had a drink in every single house in this commune. And as a result, you know, he's, he's doing what he thinks is the most important part of pre police work, which is to say to every, everybody he's working for and with, look, I'm keeping the peace for all of us. I'm trying to uphold the law for all of us. And you know me, I'm not some kind of guy in a black helmet and body armor who's gunning down anybody that they see, like some American cops seem to be but in fact, a very, very much a human being like everybody else yeah. and who's part of the life of the community. Yeah. And yeah. That, that to me, I was, I mean, I, I saw that from my buddy who was the, for many years, a local policeman, of course, that's what he did. And that's how he saw his job. And I thought, oh, why can't we have more cops like that? Yeah, where, where that, that the work of, of being that police officer is, is simply an extension of being, you know, somebody who cares about the community and, and, and yeah. who you know, brings people together for various different things and who can be trusted. Um, because I think, again, that kind of element um, in the times that we live in to find people that <coughs> in positions that we can trust and and he demonstrates that that he, he's one I, you know he's the kind of person that i wish you know i wish you could say to me martin you know come over and i'll and i'll introduce you to bruno um because i think you know spending an evening in his company would just be you know well i i do spend quite a few evenings in company with piero who's now retired because mm -hmm. i mean it is 15 years ago i began writing these books but uh no i mean i think it could not work anywhere other than a rural community, small mm. village, yeah. where you yeah. actually can get to know everybody. And most cops in big cities, they're dealing with strangers. And um, that makes things very different, I think. Yeah. So maybe I'm painting an idealized picture, but it's a real picture for this area and for, this, and for an awful lot of rural communities. I imagine in Wales and in Scotland, in parts of England as well, it's pretty much like that. Yeah. Yeah, that you are part of that. You're not an outsider or not some authoritarian figure, distant, yeah, yeah quite. Now, if we go to the setting, um, and I tried to do a, a little bit of homework, but but I know you're going to just regale us with wonders and delights. Um, the idea of, of course, you know, where that, that Spanish-French border, and we have, you know, the Basque country that straddles yeah. the Pyrenees and then on the other side um so we have you know Catalonia is you know on both sides of the Pyrenees Roussillon is it the the yeah. the, the Languedoc Roussillon yeah 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 um and I just wondered that difference in national identity um you know how 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 different is it between f French and Spanish Catalonia well, I think you've got to, I mean, it's it's important to put this into a kind of context because the point about the Perigord and in much of southwestern France is that people here think that their community is much older than France. Okay. Uh -huh. The first the first that we hear of the Franks or the French was King Clovis in the fifth century AD after the Roman Empire had, had collapsed in, in Gaul. And he comes from Franconia in the middle of Germany, uh -huh. along with all of his tribe of Franks. And there was another German tribe, the Visigoths, who were the first ones to settle around Bordeaux and across the Pyrenees. And the Visigoths then were pushed out by the Franks and they went all the way through Spain and finished up in North Africa, would you believe? Um, but I mean, the, 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 the French, the, the, the concept of France really comes in that in that uh, in the year 580, I think, when Clovis is crowned the first king of the Franks. And by at this point, the Aquitaine, the southwestern part of France, was its was completely independent. Mm -hmm. The Duchy of Toulouse was independent, the Duchy of Aquitaine was independent, and moreover, both of them 
were quite briefly occupied by the Arabs who were pouring north from their conquest of Spain, coming over the Pyrenees, and they came through the Perigord. Uh, indeed, the town near which I live, a very small town called Le Bugue, one of the one of the origins of the name we think is the Arab word for a, a military station guarding a river crossing, Al Buka. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they and the the Arabs were in southern France for over, a, over well over a hundred years. I mean, Narbonne was a major Arab trading post. And indeed, when the Franks under Pippin came down to try and liberate Narbonne, the local French people said, oh, no, 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 your taxes are much higher. And we, uh, <laughs> the, the, Arabs, uh, the Arabs are very tolerant. We'd much rather sort of hang out with them because they also have got the trade links across the Mediterranean. And that's what we live on. So no, thank you, France. Uh, and mm. then what you find is, is the two great, the two great heresies, which the Catholic Church and the French crown combined to crush, took place in southwestern France. And the first one was the Cathars or the Albigensians in the 12th century. Mm -hmm. And it was a, they, it, the, this was where they invented the Inquisition. Inquisition wasn't invented for Spain, it was invented for southwestern France. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is all entirely true. And the northern the northern barons were told, you go on down there and crush these heretics and you can take their land. And that's what they did. Uh, and not just the, the northern lords, the Archbishop of Bordeaux was one of those who was taking land around here and so on. So it's it really is, um, that was the first heresy that was crushed. The second one, of course, was Protestantism, mm -hmm. because southwestern France was a real seat of Protestantism. Um, the, the first P Protestant monarch Henry the Fourth, his base was Bejrac in the uh, in wow. the Perigord. Uh. He was he was a prince of Perigord mm. and a king of Navarre. And so we, there is this sense of this place is different. It was only yeah. in the 19th century that the French Third Republic began to try and impose a common French language upon people, and uh, something took place called the Begonia, which means in the local. Occitan tongue, it means the shaming. Mm. Children in school who began to speak any kind of, sorry. Sorry, I didn't, no. I thought I'd turn it off. No um, people in, who spoke any kind of, um, any kind of, Perigord, uh, any kind of Perigord or, or Occitan, they were shamed. They had to take their shoes off and wear them around their neck in class for the rest of the day. I mean, it was tough stuff. And it, they claimed that it was so that the soldiers could understand the officer's orders in the army. Well, that hadn't been a problem for Napoleon. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And Napoleon's army spoke Breton, they spoke Norman, they spoke Occitan, they spoke Provençal. I mean, it's only in the 19th century that France really becomes, or the government tries to make France a cultural, a coherent, a cohesive cultural unit. So the old ways still persist in many ways. And uh, the old, uh, the old cuisine, the old pride of place and so on, it's all very much alive. And I, I, I enjoy that. I, I'm fascinated by it. I mean, I just, I keep learning stuff here. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And, and how, you know, I think, again, those those expressions of a culture, uh, you know, of, of, I mean, do we call it a regional identity? If, if we, you know, if we look at Spanish Catalonia uh, and so a, a, a national identity, um, you know, how people wish to, you know, relate, talk about themselves, form their own governments. Um, and, and you bring you bring this onto these pages and here we have, you know, the, the idea of, um, you know, the resurgence of the far right in Spain at the moment. Yeah. And, and, and is it, you know, is it, is it these people who, you know, who are aiming for, you know, people who are just making music. But music that seemed to be so disruptive. That, well, mm. I think I think we're at a very um, I think in Europe we're at quite a vulnerable point at the moment. Not just in Europe, but in the Western world as a whole. I mean, some of the traditional guideposts of our society are just crumbling as mm. we watch. So, for example, I mean, we the reason we had a fairly stable left-right political system for so long in Europe 
was because we had the industrial revolution which became as a mass working class but we now have a new economy and we no longer have that mass working class mm. organized into trade unions and so on so the left has has changed but equally the right has changed as well i mean the the conservative party that i recall growing up in the 60s and 70s really changed with Thatcher and it's changed again yeah. with yeah. Brexit and yeah. the sense of populism that they have. Mm. So it's as though it's as though the old political guideposts are no longer pointing anywhere sensible. Yeah. And we're we're at, at, we're, at, we're at a loss. And again, I mean, in this sort of few days after the Royal Jubilee, you know, it's, it was striking to see how much affection there still is for the Queen, mm -hmm. but equally how much, how many questions people have about the future of the monarchy after she goes. Yes. Um, and at the same time as what does Britain mean now that you know, Scotland is agitating for its its own for its yeah. its own nationhood. The the in Wales as well, the the Plaid Cymru are rising. It's as though the old the old signposts don't quite lead to the same places anymore. Yeah, yeah. and it, and just you know, I mean, thankfully, you know, with with your book again, you know, there's there's a long if 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 one cares to do it, there's a long look back. It's not just recent mm. history. There is that longer look back and thinking. But things do change, don't they? And it's how how is that change managed? Because it's almost like is it is it inevitable um, that, that that there will be change? But 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 I wonder if you would indulge me if we can just return to Bruno, um, <laughs> because knowing yeah, I mean he's an excellent excellent chief of police, but he's also the most amazing cook uh, and and gourmand. And I just wonder, in, in, you know, in To Kill a Troubadour, and food is there and food is present, do you have a, do you have a favourite amongst the, the delicacies that are offered? Well, yes, and I'm, I am, I am, I don't eat a lot of it, but I'm very fond of foie gras. Mm -hmm. And I will only eat it, you know, I don't know, once a month, once every six weeks, mm -hmm. because it really is a delicacy. And I like to have it with a certain kind of wine, a local mm -hmm. wine called a Mombasiac. Mm -hmm. um, a wine that um, has been growing here for a thousand years and has been made initially by monks um, and um, it, that's a delightful one but there's one particular dish I'm very proud of because I sort of adapted it for the Perigord and that's a classic French dish called Boeuf Bourguignon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is a beef stew stewed in Burgundy wine hence the Bourguignon mm -hmm. I thought, OK, why don't I try and make this with our local Perigord Bejerac wine? So I did. And I thought, well, because it's it's really very simple. I mean, you take you know, cubes of, uh, of I would start off with uh, some uh, chopped up bits of uh, bits of ham with a lot of fat on them. And I, I put them into a casserole and heat it up until the, the fat starts to flow. Then I put in the uh, I put in the cubes of beef and brown them in the fat. Then I start adding the, the onions and the, then the flour to dry it a little. And then you put in the wine and I thought it needs something extra. And so what I put in was my own homemade vin de noir, which you would have read about in Bruno. And because this is the time of year, these first few days of June, mm -hmm. when we go out and we collect green, green walnuts and we get about 40 to 50 green walnuts, chop them up, put them into a great big fetu that's a great big pot and we add eight liters of red wine or white wine doesn't matter which one mm -hmm. particularly i prefer the red eight liters of red wine one liter of the strongest eau de vie you can possibly get which means it's probably not legal but nonetheless you can mm -hmm. find it around here anyway and then the locals would put in a kilo of sugar i put in half a kilo because i don't want it too cloyingly yeah. sweet and then you you leave you stir it all up you leave it in a dark corner for a couple of months then you filter it bottle it and it 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 tastes like a madeira it's delicious so into my boeuf perigordin as i call it <laughs> uh, i add a full wine glass of my own homemade uh van de noir walnut wine and this gives it a little a little extra kick a little not a, a little hint of something sweeter than your normal stew and so i'm it's so easy to make and i'm so and you can make it in britain as well um 
it's uh, it's it, it works out very very well. So I'm very very proud of that. Yeah. But then, you know, but but things like uh, the salads, they're all over my garden. The strawberries, I'm eating my own strawberries. You know, the yeah. peaches, I'll be getting my own peaches soon. Yeah. It's um, yum yum yum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and again, you know, it's like Bruno. You know, he solves he solves you know the the mysteries, the murders, the cases. And he provides us with other, such joy. There is another story, though, um, ah. in this in this novel, away, shall we say, from the political sphere. Although, as, as has been said in the past, the personal is political, so maybe not. However, um, there's a certain man released from prison, is there not? Uh, who sadly may be a bit of a menace. Um, and it's Florence's ex, or Florence, her ex. Um, I just wondered again, you know, that counterbalance that you bring, and, and it could have been any kind of story, why was this novel ripe for that tandem that, that you created? Well, because, um, I mean, Bruno is in a way responsible for bringing Florence and her her infant twins mm. to Saint Denis. Uh, on another case earlier on in the series, um, he finds her uh, working a, a sort of almost a menial, a menial job uh, in a, a local truffle market, and being the victim of uh, being, you know, sexually harassed by a, a, a thug of a boss. And um, Bruno thinks she's a much more interesting person than she appears to be. And then he finds out she's got a chemistry, had a chemistry diploma from university. And uh, he solves the case, which means arresting the horrid boss. And uh, then he hears there's a vacancy for a science teacher at the college in Saint-Denis. And he says, would you be interested in coming to work in Saint-Denis? Where, we can, where the school can give you a subsidized apartment for you and your kids. And my friends and I will do it up for you, so mm -hmm. it's going to be all right. And so, you know, she, in a way, he feels responsible for Florence, and he's mm -hmm. terribly fond of the children, and they're fond of him and of his dog. And um, then in the previous novel, Bruno is teaching the kids to swim. And... Uh, when they succeed, Florence, who is standing at the side of the pool in a green bikini, looking very fetching, mm. she leaps in and hugs him in gratitude, and he's terribly conscious of the of her breasts against mm. his chest. And uh, so, at that point, I realise, hmm, I've got to do something with this relationship, because people were writing to me and saying, "Is she the one? It has Bruno finally." finally. Found <laughs> Yeah. With this, you know, with this already ready-made family for him, and I thought, well, I, I don't know, I don't know, um, but I mean, we have, we don't know enough about Florence. We've mm. got to bring back this. We've got to go into the backstory about why she got divorced and who was the husband, yeah. and why was he? Uh, nobody knew he was in prison, least of all Bruno. And then you know they learn that he's coming out, and oh, what happens now? And uh, so, yeah, that's a sort of a second story that comes in. I always like to have two stories yeah. working away. You see? Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it because it's almost the one, the one story. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's close to Bruno because he's invited, you know, he's, he's set up the, you know, the, the festival there with, with the band and everything of the group. But this is very personal, isn't it? You know, with France, yeah. this is very personal. And it's how does he deal with both these, you know, these equa this equation of these two sides? And, and again, I think that is you know, it's such an admirable way to, you know, you watch what he can and can't do or how he feels about things. And that, yeah. Well, it's, and of course, but this is the kind of job that a, a village policeman has because different things are happening at once. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a crime that's really important that's got to be solved. But on the other hand, there's one of the neighbours, one of the people of the community, you know, whom he likes a lot and whose yeah. kids are very close to it. And she feels in danger. And what do we do about it? And so on. And, and Bruno has enough friends in areas like, you know, the, the magistrates and, and so on that he can he can start putting together something that will that will sustain Florence and I'm I was particularly pleased with the um, 
I, I'd always wanted to, to develop Father Santru, the local the local priest, mm -hmm. um, because uh, we did we had a priest here when I first came who was exactly like this. He he was so keen on the local supporting a local rugby club. Mm -hmm. People knew that if they went to if they went to confession on a certain day at a certain time, he'd rattle through it in like thirty <laughs> seconds so he could get to the match on time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, which of course made him the perfect kind of priest for a, a place in the Perigord where rug rugby is the real religion. So I, uh, I, I, I was, I enjoyed having that relationship building up as well, because uh, it, to me it, 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 it enriches my pleasure as an author. Yeah. But I think it enriches the book as well to have these characters: the Baron, the priest, the mayor. Florence and her kids, yeah. Fabio the doctor, Gilles the reporter, to have them all coming in at the same time as well. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah. I, I think you know. I think it's again. It's that you 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 know you you give us this beautiful community to be part of. It's not just you know a lone detective who you know who's you know away from everybody and 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 whose whose life is very grim and bleak. But you know. You, we have Bruno, who is, you know, who is so full of life and, and all those different aspects, and then all the people around him. It's like a little mini cosmos. It's, yeah. well, but this is this is what life is like in this village mm. where I am. Yeah. I mean, as soon as as soon as we end this with this, I'm going to go down to a neighbor for the evening apéro. We'll be having a little glass of something, <laughs> and then we'll walk the dog, and then we'll talk about dinner and so on. Um, and if it's not that friend, it's another friend, or there'll probably be a son of somebody else will turn up at the house as well. I mean, it's a community. What can I say? You know, you go to the market on market day and you spend half the time just shaking hands and bonjour, ça va, very bien. And I, I love it. And just as Bruno walks down the street, yes. yeah. kissing woman after woman after woman, <laughs> it's a bit like that. And when I walk across the bridge in the river on market day, I'm stopping to to kiss half a dozen women whom I know. And it's, uh, but it's all in friendship. It's not indeed, indeed, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's that, again, it's the, it's the fiber and the connections of community that that, yeah. that, that makes such a difference. And um, I, I have a couple more questions, if I may, because okay. I don't want to yeah. keep you from your your apparel. It's you know. <laughs> I understand priorities, um, <laughs> but but um, well, we are familiar with with Balzac the dog, but we also have the Bruce. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tell us about the Bruce. Okay. Well, you may recall in a previous novel, it was time for Balzac to become a to become a father, and you know we have the first big romantic moment when. Balzac meets Diane de Poitiers, named for the mistress of a French king, this beautiful female basset to be introduced into the, the delights of canine love. And uh, so I, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed writing this. And of course now uh, Diane de Poitiers is having the puppies. And the puppies are, Bruno gets two of the puppies to either sell or to keep mm -hmm. or whatever. And he gives one of them to, um, he, give, he was going to give one of them to Florence's children. Mm -hmm. But she said she thought they were too young to be responsible for them. So he gives one to Eveline, who is the head of the gendarme, who is also getting promoted, promoted to be a, a, the head, still in the same region of even more gendarmes. Um, and uh, then the next one goes to, to Rod McRae, who is the no longer retired rock musician uh, from the 60s and 70s, who's retired there. And of course, he was in a previous book of, and he wants to have uh, wants to have one of the puppies. And uh, so he has he's a Scot. So he calls his the Bruce for Robert the Bruce. And uh, and um, um, Eveline calls her female puppy Gabrielle Destre, because Gabrielle Destre was the mistress of King Henry the Fourth, who was the prince, the Prince of Perigord, and so on. And we take these things very seriously around here. And so, uh, yeah, and the Bruce is is around, and we'll be seeing the Bruce yes. and Gabrielle again, yes. and Excellent. and Excellent. Hector the horse and. Yeah. The whole menagerie, yeah. yeah. But this is how life this is how life is. You know, your dog has puppies. Some of the puppies stay around. Yeah. They enrich your life. It's uh, but this is the thing, it is a gloriously full life. What I'm really trying to I mean, okay, I like writing these sort of slightly political crimey story crime mm -hmm. stories, but 
I, I mean, I really enjoy writing about this community of the Peridor and these people. And is that not really the secret of of your writing? I'll come back. I said at the beginning. I think it's the way you blend these things. You know, you you know, you, you talked about the the walnuts sitting in the wine, um, and I wonder, you know, the way you know these these, these different aspects marinate together. And and you know and they and they come out in the way that they do in the way that you tell stories. Um, yeah, I, part of me wishes you know like you're talking about the troubadours and the singing of these songs and very often these songs told stories or what they usually was to recount a story. Yeah. And, and you know setting your work to to music, I'm sure it would just be it would just work so well <laughs> because of the way it all it all comes together. Um. I, I've got a bit of a difficult last question, but maybe it won't be difficult. I hope not. But 15 books and 15 years, you know, you and Bruno, do you think you would ever tire of, 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 of this man? Or, or is there so much more for you and him? I, it's not just him and me. I, I, I'm still learning more and more about this place, this region, mm -hmm. like the way I learned about the troubadours and the whole of this Arab tradition that came through the troubadours. I just keep on finding stuff out and I meet people and they tell me something and I start following it up. I mean, it's like any journalist. I mean, you pick up something that interests you and you, yeah. you just follow the thread. Yeah. And that's, that's what I do. And I've got... I mean, I've I've got sort of ideas for the next three or four books already, you know, whirling away in the back of my mind. Yes. Um, in fact, I've almost finished the next one right now. So, <laughs> um, oh. which yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you. Well, right. Thank you very much. But but your you know, the eye for detail, devotion to a series, to to you know, to keep that momentum. Um, other people may have similar series with such longevity, shall we say, but that sense of what am I going to discover now? What <laughs> else, you know, what, 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 new, what new knowledge am I going to come away with? You know, never mind the mystery, which is going to be great, or the murder, or whatever, but, but what new, new information? Martin, what, I want to... New dishes. <laughs> indeed, as well. Yes, yes. Do your cooking as well. Martin, I want yeah. to thank you so much for our time together. Well, thank you. Uh, it okay, is, it is my such pleasure, a, really. I, 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 you know, I mean, and I hope, I hope we can, I hope we can make this an, an annual, an annual feast. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and, and I shall do mine. Um, uh, and again, I just wish you all the very best. Um, to Kill a Troubadour uh, is out, uh, I do believe, in hardback, paperback audiobook and ebook so plenty of possibilities of getting into into the novel um and yeah yeah enjoy readers uh get <laughs> transported so worth it martin see you soon thank you dr noir a pleasure <laughs> bye for now bye bye, bye. Thank you. bye.